Welcome to the Smart Dating Academy podcast. I'm Bella Gandhi, the founder of Smart Dating Academy and your host. I started Smart Dating Academy in 2009 because I had this crazy knack of giving people dating advice that actually worked, that I took. I've been married for almost 25 years, and now my company helps people to date smarter and to find love. This podcast is meant to bring more love into your life no matter where you are and what you do. And we're here to bring more life into your love. Welcome back, smart daters. I'm so excited to talk to you today about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, near and dear, I know, to your heart or somebody that you know, um, and it'll be very close to your heart. And what we're going to talk about is healing after betrayal and finding love again. And I have one of my favorite people literally on planet earth who I've gotten to know over the past three years. And I'm tickled pink that she is here with me to chat with you guys. This is like an after dark episode. We're going to talk about the real deal um, of my friend and Badass, kick ass woman, serial entrepreneur, Rachel Graham. Rachel is not, Rachel is the founder of the Healing Springs Ranch and the founder of Evolve and Transform. She is a speaker, she is a mom, she is a friend. She was a Smart Dating Academy client that has now become an incredibly dear friend. Rachel, welcome. Thank you, Bella. Wow, what an intro. Um, I appreciate you uh, sharing a little bit of my story, but wow, that was that was very flattering. I appreciate it. And I'm grateful to be here. Um, as you know, you've been a tremendous and had a tremendous impact in my world. And um, I'm glad I get to share it with your viewers um, and listeners on kind of the journey you and I've had. Um, I did want to say one thing too. I'm a co-founder in Healing Springs Ranch. I have tremendous business partners that help deliver the quality care. And we can talk about that later because as you know, that was um, my story was the genesis for how I got into that industry. So thank you, mm-hmm. Bella, for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. And you know, Rachel is here with us because her story to some extent is your story, is my story, which one of us hasn't been betrayed in some way, shape or form. And we've been forced to get down on our knees. It can reduce us to nothing. And we've all had to figure out our way, or maybe for you, you're still down there on the ground, figuring out how can I heal? Can I heal? So Rachel, I'm going to, I'm, I would love for you to tell us your story of betrayal and healing, um, and, and, and the strength that you've had to get to where you are now. So I'm handing you the mic to just talk to us for real. Thank you, Bella. And, and yeah, you're right. Betrayal is something we're all going to experience in some fashion or form, um, unfortunately. And it's one of the deepest, um, probably most assaulting things that can happen to us as a human being. When we put faith and confidence in someone and trust in an individual and they in turn violate that mm. particular trust. And so for, in my case, you know, I've, I went through a situation as you know, and I'm not going to go into all the graphic details, but you know, in my marriage ended because of betrayal, um, or at least that's why I thought it ended because of financial and and physical betrayal. Um, and I really, at the time felt like it was all his fault. Um, what happened was his fault. He did this to me. Okay woe is me, this horrible thing happened. And yes, it was a horrible thing. However, I found myself in this victim mentality and that victim mentality, I kept cycling through that. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the drama triangle and the the victim's one of the roles on the drama triangle. And I found that so long as I stayed in that victim mentality or my friends even supported me staying in that victim mentality by saying, yeah, you know, he's a this or that or whatever, or family members, 
um, I wasn't able to push through it and move forward. And so I did a lot of personal healing to get through this particular situation and get to the other side to where I actually am healthier for having gone through this. I have more self-awareness. I have more ability to see my role. And and that's something that was a unique thought process to me when Mm. someone said to me, well, what was your role in all of this? And I said, what do you mean my role? I'm the victim. I don't have, I'm the victim. I'm the victim. I don't have a role. This happened to me. Exactly. He went outside the marriage. And so I'm trying to place blame on another individual. And the reality of it is, is that marriages don't end because of infidelity or relationships don't end because of infidelity. It is a symptom of a much larger problem. And there's culpability on both people's parts. While you may not have been the one that acted out, there's something that you need to address in you so that you don't repeat this pattern. And I know that's something you talk geniusly about is when you, especially when you're referring to like a narcissist and making the same mistakes. And so what I learned in this is we oftentimes will continue to make these mistakes until we heal and grow from them and learn the patterns that are causing us to find ourselves in these situations. And so for me, when I put the mirror in front of me, which was absolutely the most painful thing I've ever had to do and look at it and say, do I, yeah, do I like what I see in the mirror? And then I had to come to terms and acknowledge that I, in my marriage, was emotionally unavailable. You wouldn't know that. Uh, Yeah, you and I are good friends. I bear my soul to you. I I feel comfortable being vulnerable with you because I trust you. I had to learn how to do that. I couldn't do that even with my closest friends. But yet I didn't see that as an issue because when you're coming, when you're growing up, you identify with your family of origin the way you grew up, the people you grew up, the friends that you had, all those kinds of things. And we take on those traits. And in my environment, I wasn't in, I was, I never felt um, capable of being very vulnerable and open with feelings, thoughts, and ideas. And so I took that through my relationships and I actually sought out people in retrospect, looking at it, that were the same way, that were incapable of doing that because it's like two emotionally stunted people come together thinking they're going to make it whole, if that makes sense. And so I had to even learn that what that was, I didn't even know what that was. And I figured that out through therapy and through um, giving myself time and space um, after my marriage ended, which is something I highly suggest to everybody out there. Our natural instinct is, oh, I want to feel validated that someone finds me attractive or someone wants to go out with me and I'm going to run out and find someone. I'll show that person how attractive I am to the opposite sex, you know, all this stuff. And the reality is we miss a golden opportunity to stand back and really reflect and heal such that we can present as a better partner and choose. Right. And, and you talk about your picker when your picker's off, have a better picker going into a new relationship because like attracts like. So if you're emotionally unhealthy, you're going to attract emotionally unhealthy. If you're emotionally healthy, you're going to find someone that's emotionally healthy. The two don't go together when someone is unhealthy is not going to end up with a healthy person, period. doesn't work. It won't make sense. You're so right. You're so right. And when you did this work, you know, you switched from victim mentality and one day you held the mirror up. How did your emotional availability show up? I love that you were able, because it's really hard for all of us to say, you know, you hurt me. Okay. But what was my role in that? Right. What was my role in that? And what, what did you discover about your role in your marriage? So when the kind of the opposite or the antithesis to um, being a victim is to be a creator. So when you ask yourself, what role did I play in this? And then I'm going to look at that and go more in depth and address and explore and understand that that's when you're getting off the drama triangle, which is Cartman's drama triangle. And I'll come back and share a little bit more about it. Yeah. But you're shifting from that victim, unhealthy victim role where you're powerless, things happen to you, you have no control, um, you, you, you have no ownership in finding a better solution to things. But when you shift to a healthier version, you become a creator and a creator says, okay, shit happens, excuse my French, but it does. 
okay, well, how do I respond to that? How do, what opportunity does it create for me? Is there a learning opportunity? Is there, in my case, a business model opportunity? <laughs> yeah. What is it out there that sits there in that creator role? And the creator feels empowered by this, this ugly thing that's happened. They feel in control or ability to take control. And it's a mindset shift that happens right here. And most people don't even realize they have the power to do that. And for me, that shift happened in the course of about two minutes. And when I look back at that moment, that pivotal two minutes, and it was a very spiritual moment, I, I've shared it with you and I'll share it with your viewers where I was going through, I was in the depths of hell. I was going through kind of uncovering um, betrayal after betrayal after betrayal. And as I uncovered more and more, I felt smaller and smaller and smaller. And I just felt beat down, beat down, beat down. And I came home to uh, my home at the time. And there was a water coming out the front door from a pipe that had backed up. Oh God! And um, I had, it was a horrible week. I had been dealing with my marital situation, talking to divorce attorneys, um, had to euthanize my dog, which happened to be a wedding gift to oh. my former husband at the time. Um, and I kind of had this weird sense of I'm having to euthanize my dog and I'm going to euthanize my marriage too. You know, it was kind of a surreal experience. And then having this, this flooding happen all while trying to work and manage two young kids. And I, I felt the weight of the world at that moment. It was like one more thing. And so here I am in a victim mentality saying, God, why are you doing this to me? So I walk into my house. I asked the babysitter to take the kids and go away for a few hours because I knew it was about to combust. Mm. And I had this moment, um, a very, I'll call it a spiritual moment where I had to release. I had been going through everything in kind of an emotionally frigid way, trying to navigate and take care of responsibilities, keep up um, you know, things for my kids, for the sake of my kids, um, be strong, don't cry, don't do all these things. And I finally hit my breaking point. And when I did, I fell into the water on my floor, screaming at God and oh screaming God. about why are you doing this to me? See, the, 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 there's the victim language. Why are you doing this to me? How much more are you going to give me? I can't take any more. What did I do to deserve this? All of that very victim-y language. And I felt what felt like a hand on the back of my neck, pick me up, pull me to my feet and tell me you're going to be all right. I'm trying to show you something. And I replied out loud saying, you've got my effing attention. And it was at that point that I allowed myself to shift to a creator role saying, okay, there's some reason I'm going through all of this. There's something I'm supposed to learn. There's something the universe is trying to tell me. And maybe I just need to go with it and stop trying to control it. Oof. And so I surrendered to that and it led me down a path in understanding addiction, mental health, um, going through that process and, and seeing some opportunity to change that industry along with some of my business partners. Um, and that's how I got into Healing Springs because I was appalled at the type of treatment that was out there for my loved one um, and really wanted to, to change the, the narrative that was being played out there. And so I took everything I had learned um, and started down that path and got involved. And so my very darkest moment became the most enlightened moment I think I've ever had in my life. Wow. 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 You know, I listened to, and am a fan of Tony Robbins. And one of the things that he always says is, can you find the meaning in the mess. Mm -hmm. And you were the definition of finding the meaning at that moment, you are literally on your knees in the water and you feel this hand pulling you up by the collar saying you like, I'm going to show you the way out. And you let that create itself and you let yourself find the meaning, which resulted in you and I'm, I'm guessing in some senses, this was a blessing to you as well to have this new idea and this light bulb. It's not going to replace a, 
a, a marriage that had died, but suddenly you have this new purpose to put that energy and all of the work that you had done on yourself and your business acumen into as, you know, something that, you know, is now helping so many people turn their lives around. Amazing. No, thank you. I think, you know, I learned something in, in that process in that it was okay to be vulnerable with myself. It's okay to be real with myself. It's okay to say out loud, I'm disappointed in you, Rachel. You could have done this differently. And it was okay to be sad. It was okay to be mad. And it was okay. Sometimes you shift around all these different emotions. Um, and, and sometimes you don't even know why. But I did learn something very important from um, through my the therapy I did to kind of work through this. And it was that you can't go around this pain, this grief, um, you, you can't, people want the fast ticket, you know, they have a fast pass to go through something, <laughs> you know, to, I want to go around it, over it, under it. Cause it's too painful to go through it, but that's not an option. You have to go through it, but while you're going through it, it doesn't have to be this dark cave and, and, um, scary experience. There'll be moments that it's scary, but there's also these beautiful moments and I, the best compliment, I received the best compliment when I was in one of the darkest places of my life from someone, it was a, a coach from a leadership program I was in at the time. And he said to me, you're a lotus flower blooming in the muck. And you think about that, the lotus can't bloom if it doesn't have muck around it. So that's something wow. I remembered on my dark day. You're a lotus flower girl, you're a lotus flower, you're going to bloom and you've got to have this muck to help you do that. And so I go back to that compliment. I'll never forget that moment. I go back to that. So I learned that you have to go through this and you have to allow yourself the time and the space. And you can't really go through it effectively if you're too busy jumping back into the dating world and needing to feel validated by others. Because at the end of the day, if you don't love yourself, no one else is going to love you the way that you're going to crave that. And it's not their job to love you. It's yours to make yourself happy, to love yourself, and then invite someone into your world to share in that, but you want someone too that loves themselves too um, and is in a healthy place. So that's a, a something I learned during those dark moments. And you guys, this is, I think, something that's important and we talk about a lot is that loving yourself doesn't mean you don't have broken parts to you. It doesn't mean that your healing is complete. It just means that you have accepted yourself for the things that you have been through, the landmines you have been over, and you're okay with who you are and the, the scars and the warts and all of you that comes with you. It doesn't, sometimes when we hear you've got to love yourself, and Rachel, I know you agree with this, it doesn't mean everything is healed up and put away nicely and it'll never come back, right? At a certain point, there are parts of us that don't heal and we learn how to cope with those parts. Mm -hmm. I heard something the other day was another profound thought and it was really around leadership, but you could change the lead um, part to live. Live your life through your scars, not with open wounds, through the mm. open wounds. You know, um, you need to, it's your job to heal your wounds. And then we all walk around with scars. I mean, we're all perfectly imperfect. We all have life experiences. We've all had life challenges. Um, you know, I can't compare my traumas to someone else's. That's not fair because it's theirs to own. It's mine to own. And we have our own experiences in it. But I can extend grace and compassion to someone in understanding when someone's been through a, a difficult time. So, you know, live, you know, with the scars, not with the wounds sitting there. Cause if you live with the wounds, you're they're constantly opened and they constantly weep and bleed. And you're, you're gonna do that on another relationship and then wonder why that's not the right relationship. You're gonna do it, you know, in work or whatever it is with a friendship, whatever it is. And you're gonna wonder why this keeps happening. And it's because you have not healed those wounds. And until you do, you're almost not whole. You're whole with the, the scar, but you're not whole when you have these open infected wounds. No, it's so true. And you said something earlier that I want to come back to, and maybe you can share some of your best thoughts around this. You had that moment where you said, you realized my role in this was being emotionally unavailable. And sometimes we call that in dating parlance, emotionally avoided, right? It just means I 
kind of am an independent person. I can deal with stuff on my own. I don't do a lot of feelings. I don't do a lot of intimacy and, and you march forward and you can be very successful in your life. But when you realize that you can be emotionally avoidant and you know, the, the statistics say one in four of us have what we call an avoidant attachment system. What are some things that you can tell you know, someone, if you're avoidant, here are some ways to help yourself. Do you have anything that you can share with us that helped you? Yes. Practicing vulnerability, you know, being able to identify trustworthy people. That's, that's the big piece. When you're avoidant, it's because you don't trust, right? You have, you have built up walls and barriers, and it's usually because of a coping skill you've had as a child or maybe you didn't feel safe in an environment. So you learn to throw that wall up and right, no one gets right. in that wall. And when I was in high school, I had a boyfriend tell me, he goes, you're like Rapunzel. You're up in the tower and you let your hair down just enough that I can almost grab it. Then you yank it up. And I thought that was the weirdest thing he said to me in high school. And I didn't get it at the time. And now it makes, he was describing that. That's exactly what he was describing in his 18 year old way, you know? Um, he was describing that and I carried that with me. And so for me to get real with myself and then to be able to tell you who I am, let you see who I am, really let you experience things with me that I would not normally tell someone. Once I learned how to do that and I learned it's not so scary. Yeah. People are going to disappoint you. That's just life, you know, but and I can be vulnerable with someone and, and I can be vulnerable with a stranger now. And I wasn't able to do that before for fear of judgment or um, more hurts, whatever it may be. And, and so I now spend my life being vulnerable on stages and communicating on podcasts and shows and, and teaching at my facility because I've learned that being vulnerable is actually quite healing. Brene Brown's a good subject matter expert on that, but it is quite healing to be vulnerable. And when you are who you authentically are and you let the world see that and people still like you for it, that's validating, you know? And the, the thing that I learned in the process is most relationships have a shelf life of some sort. Some are a lifetime, some are an hour, some are a five minute, you know, passing in target, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but relationships have a shelf life. And as human beings, we try to extend the shelf life on relationships that we need to sunset in our world. And the most loving thing that you can do is to sunset a relationship when it's hit that shelf life. And in doing so, you're, you're actually allowing that person to go on and find what they're looking for. Um, you know, I, I, I've encountered situations where someone's a great person. They're just not my person, you know, in, in the dating world, they're wonderful people, they're just not my person. And why would I want to try to force that to happen or work or go down that path because someone's showing an interest in me when that's really unfair to them? And, and so that's a big piece that I would say is important. The second thing I would say to people too is when you get out and start dating again, um, you want to do that out, obviously after you've healed, but you're going to face some rejection. But rejection is something we should be grateful for because rejection is protection and it's redirection. So it's oh, saying say that again you, for the people in the back. Okay. For the people in the back, it's rejection is protection and it's redirection. So it's an opportunity for you to step back and say, this path I'm going down or this person I'm in, in a relationship with is not my person and that's okay. And then it's time for me to welcome that rejection instead of saying there's something wrong with me just acknowledging that this wasn't a right fit um and that could be a job maybe you didn't get a job that you wanted whatever it may be you know I'm, we're talking about dating and relationships so i'll put it in that context but it frees you up to go find the very thing you are looking for and i have yet to hear someone say i was rejected by someone that and then they did the work that's an important part and then they found someone new and they sit there and they go, what was I thinking, you know, back then when I was, you know, crying over that. And that was the only person for me and whatnot. Once they've done the healing and that journey and they end up in a healthier relationship, they look back and say, you know what, that needed to end. I just didn't know it at the time. Wow. 
No, it's so true. We all need to, we all need to do our work. And as Rachel, you know, alluded to, we talk a lot about fixing your picker and so much of the time when we haven't done that work, or even sometimes when we have done that work, right? We still, human beings are creatures of habit. We tend to want to do what feels comfortable versus what's intellectually right for us, right? And that's where we really help people to put the guardrails around you to make sure, sure, sure that you're picking people that are actually good for you. For women, we call them high GHQ guys, high and good husband qualities, people that are going to provide you with that safe, secure connection that you're looking for. So Rachel, what made you know, or what made you, you know, kind of put your first toe back into the dating pool? And where are you now? Tell us your process. You were a single woman who dealt with betrayal, physical, financial, you turned that into the mess, into your meaning. You started and co-founded Healing Springs Ranch, which helps people that are struggling with addiction to turn their lives around. It's an amazing place in Texas. And if you're curious about it, make sure you check it out. Now, once you did all of that, tell us about your dating journey. So I spent probably five, six years working on me. Um, I was too scared to get back. The dating world had changed so much for me. I mean, after 20 years, um, entering back into the dating world um, was just frightening to me. And uh, I had a really good friend who said, you know what you need? And I said, what? She goes, you need a Bella. And I was like, who's a Bella? What's a Bella? (laughs) And so she said, you need to call Bella. And I remember calling you and I told you my sordid story. It's kind of one of those where you just want to have a um, cry afterwards or a box of tissues. And I told you my whole story. And but I had felt for the first time I'm ready to explore now something else that's very scary to me which was dating. Um, So again, dating at this age is different than in your twenties because you're not as interested in, you know, you're not going to have children with this person. In theory, I was not going to commingle funds or retirement or, or assets. And so you're dating for different reasons. It's more about compatibility and can we enjoy life together? How will this person be um, if I need them to care give or if I need to care give for them? Um, you start thinking about different things in your twenties, don't even cross your radar. And so, um, I was fortunate that I found a Bella, a, and I'll put air quotes, Bella, um, who helped me really kind of enter into this, this, um, cave or this, this, this abyss that I was not familiar with at all and hold my hand as I navigated these waters. I think you remember how how scared I was at the time to even just the online dating thing. When you said you have to get online, I was like, what, 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 like, how do I background screen all these people, (laughs) (laughs) which you did. I did. I was so scared, but you know, I was like a horse. Like when you think about a little um, yearling, that's standing up for the first time. It's been born. It's only a few hours or days old and it goes to stand up and its legs are real shaky and it's trying its hardest to support its weight. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt like when I came to you the first time and kind of my getting my legs about me in the dating world um, and, and having the confidence and the skills. It's like anything else, you know, you need skills going and, and tools going into this process. And none of us get that when we're younger. You In high school, you don't go to like learn how to date 101 class. You know, you just kind of do it and you explore it. Well, you're gonna have, there's a little bit of that, but there is some science and tools that you all so graciously share and educate on that help making navigating this field um, easier. And it g- gave me an opportunity to spot the, the, the creepers or to spot that they're not your person, people faster um, before you go down a path and maybe you're interested in this person and then you realize this person is not your person. Um, so I'm grateful for what you all gave me and it, in short, it's confidence, a level of confidence and tools. Mm. And where are you now, Rachel Graham? So, you know, I, the one thing I had to kind of get my head around and I, I've talked with my girlfriends about that is, you know, When you start dating, you often think, well, I want to get remarried and we're going to do this. We're going to have this life. And I had to get okay with the fact 
that in my own mind, I didn't necessarily want to be remarried. I, it's not that I, I, I love the, the whole process of marriage and whatnot, but I felt like I was at a place in my life where marriage wasn't the important attribute. It was finding a really high quality guy to, that I can enjoy doing things with, that we have a good time, that um, and I had some very specific criteria and that you helped me with that, get ahead of that and say, these are the deal breakers and make sure that I flush that out when I'm meeting folks um, to make sure that I, when you, when you don't have a plan or it's like a strategic plan at work, you have a strategic plan on how you're going to embark on something. And if you don't have a plan and you're navigating these waters, you're bound to kind of trip and make some mistakes. So you gave me the opportunity to be very clear at what I was looking for, what was important, what the things I could tolerate. Maybe it, you know, wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I could tolerate that. But I think the other thing I realized is there's no Prince Charming and there's no princess out there. You know, there are people that are, can be very good people that um, have their own scars um, and that, you know, are living life much like you learning sometimes and evolving and growing. You know, so this notion of my prince hasn't come yet, there is no prince, that's a fairy tale. You know, we're all perfectly imperfect and relationships are gonna be work, but they're beautiful and they can be beautiful work even in the darkest moments. So I have been very fortunate to meet someone and, you know, be able to explore, you know, life with that, you know, is, is a lot of fun, can be hilarious and I'm comfortable. And I, I learned, I stopped trying to figure out the next step. I'm letting things unfold organically as a type A entrepreneur, female, you know, typically we want to know where we're going, how we're doing this, what date and time are we doing this and those types of things. And I've had to learn to just kind of let it go. Doesn't mean that I don't want to plan on when we're going to get together or go out on date night. That's still important. But, you know, not having to sit back and analyze a relationship on where it's going to be tomorrow, where's it going to be a year from now and just letting it go and evolve, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And Rachel, where did you meet? Can I say he's your fly guy and you can say why he's your fly guy and uh, what happens when he walks through an airport? How did you meet fly guy? Oh, uh, I met him online, actually, using the tools that you gave me. And uh, he's a pilot, so I call him affectionately fly guy. Um, he's a very good man and he's he's fabulous. But so he... Cute, uh, yeah. He's, 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 we have a lot of good times together. And, you know, the thing about dating too, at this age is typically like he has kids. I have kids, so, you know, your kids, there's oftentimes ex spouses that you have to take into account. So it puts a different kind of style on the relationship than when you're in your twenties and you're, there is none of those roles or people. And, and so what I would tell people is extend grace and compassion to each other, especially when you're navigating challenges and being supportive of those challenges because sometimes we see things differently. You know, he's raising his kids one way. I raise my kids another way. Sometimes it's very similar. Sometimes it's very different. That's okay. There's no right or wrong, you know, and being supportive and, and helpful um, in that role that you're in as the girlfriend or the, you know, I don't know, partner, whatever you want to call it, role um, with an individual. So you guys helped me do that. I met him online and went on several dates um, and it was the slow burn like you talk about, not this um, jump right in, you know, flutters, what do you call it? The butterflies and all those things when you talk butterflies about Butterflies are that. bad, butterflies yeah. are bad. And what starts fast ends fast. Yes. And so we just been letting it progress the way it needs to progress. So, um, but I, I do credit you with, with giving me that confidence in the tools because I had no idea what I was doing and I, and you didn't let me swim alone out there. There were sharks in the water and we figured them out pretty quick together, um, where to swim, where not to swim. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Bella, for everything you've, you've mm -hmm. done for me. It's an honor, 100%. And Rachel, tell us, you mentioned something earlier in the show that I wanna come back to. Tell us a little bit about what you teach at Evolve and at Healing about what you call the drama triangle and how we can stay out of the drama triangle and dating or how that can potentially affect us. 
Yeah, this, so the, it's Cartman, Stephen Cartman came up with the drama triangle and there's three basic roles. So hence the triangle, three points there. So one of them is the victim role that we've talked quite a bit about. Another one is the persecutor, or sometimes you hear it called in the clinical terms, the perpetrator role. And then the third one is the coach, or excuse me, the rescuer, the rescuer. So you have the rescuer, the persecutor, and the victim. And those are all three very unhealthy roles that we all play. First of all, we all play on the drama triangle, whether we want to or not. And the concept is to recognize when you're on the drama triangle and shift to David Emerald's empowerment dynamic, which has the three roles, but they're healthy versions of each one of the drama triangle roles. So in the empowerment dynamic, you have the creator. So the victim morphs into a creator. So rather than the world is happening to me, it's about what opportunity does this present for me? Mm. The rescuer morphs into a coach. So rather than me rescuing you and doing these things to help you, I'm teaching you how to do it for yourself, if that makes sense. And then the persecutor becomes a challenger. So persecutor is the person sitting there doing this and wagging their finger in your face, telling you, um, you, you're a bad person. You're never going to understand this. You've embarrassed the family, whatever it may be. And the challenger says, wait a minute, I know you're capable of doing more, or you've got the skills within you to be more successful on whatever it may be. And so I give the example, if you think about in relationships, um, the person, if, if you're going out with someone and they sit there and talk about everything their ex-spouse did to them, you know, oh, my ex-spouse did this and was this, and um, you know, they, the victim language, that's probably gonna be a red flag that you need to talk about, like with your, your coaches, your dating coaches, because someone that's consistently in the victim role is in a very unhealthy state. Now, if you see someone that's always in the rescuer role, which I'm a recovering rescuer, Same. that can Same. some, <laughs> there's a lot of us out there. Um, rescuers get their own validation by helping someone. And so what looks to be an altruistic motivator, it's really self-serving because it's, I don't feel complete unless I can take care of someone else and I'm taking care of someone else so I can avoid looking at my own problems. And oftentimes that rescuer gets praised out there. Oh, you know, you go to great aunt Sally. She's really good at helping people solve problems and she'll help you fix this and da, 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 da. Well, great aunt Sally is probably a rescuer, you know, or the parent that, you know, gives their kid money even when they know they shouldn't be doing that, um, you know, just to, um, have them be quiet because they're nagging them for money. You know, you're rescuing them. So then on the persecutor side, you know, that person will actually go to the challenger and all these rules are really, really important. So an example of that might be in a relationship. If you're in a relationship with someone who's persecuting, telling you you're fat, that dress looks horrible on you. I don't like that color lipstick on you. Um, your friends are awful. I hate your mother you know, blah, 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 blah. Someone that's constantly doing that, that's going to be persecutor mentality. And that's something I would, I would run. You'll see that a lot with the narcissist. They bob in that persecutor and mm. that victim role quite a bit. Uh, so really and truly what someone should be doing is challenging you. So for example, let's say you're walking around saying, you know, I really need to lose some weight. And your partner saying, yeah, you're fat. That's persecutor. They say, what can I do to support you? Maybe we should get up and go for a walk instead of sitting here watching a movie or whatever it may be. That's challenging someone. And that's a loving thing. And it's coming from a place of love, not attacking the core essence of what or who someone is, if that makes sense. You see it a lot in parenting. The rescuer is the helicopter parent when we think about that in school. And the rescuer can't exist without a victim. So sometimes the rescuer will create their own victim so they can jump in and rescue you know, and the persecutors oftentimes the, the mean teacher or the school that's making this happen to this poor little child, you know, the teacher says you got a D on your, your grade and the parents upset going up there to argue with the teacher about the child's D when in fact the child did earn a D on the, the, the assignment. And what the parent can do is, is challenge a kid saying, I know you know how to do math better, little Johnny, let's get you a tutor, let's figure out what we need to do. And I'm going to be here right here with you or helping you. Um, procure those resources to be more successful, but you're going to have to do the work. You're going to have to learn how to do the math. A rescuer would do their math for them and turn it in. Um, and we're not going to allow you to be a victim. We're going to say, little Johnny, what do you need to do to be successful in math? 
so that we don't get a D again. So you see it in all aspects of life, in all relationships. But that's the, the concept is getting your, recognizing when you're on the drama triangle and how to get off. And I'll conclude it with, we can play different roles at different time with different people. So, and, and in different roles within the same argument. So it could be that you feel persecuted by your spouse. And so all of a sudden you're feeling like a victim, but then you turn yourself into the persecutor by firing back at that person. So that happens. Um, and we can also play on that drama triangle all by ourselves. So I tell my clients the story about how I, I flirt with the same 20 pounds. I go up and down and up and down. And um, there's probably a whole backstory behind all of that. Isn't but there always I, to wait? <laughs> there is. And so one of the things that let's say I've had a really crazy day at work and it's been stressful and I come home and I know I have the little bluebell ice cream cups in my freezer. And I love those things. There's nothing better than one of those little bluebell vanilla. It has to be vanilla ice cream cuts. And so I tell myself, so here's the victim saying, oh, I've had a horrible day, you know, woe is me. And then the rescuer saying, you know, we've got the ice cream in the freezer. You could have one of those. They're only 150 calories. And you did a lot of walking today. Look at your watch. How many steps did you do? You know, you can have one of those cups. And so what do I do? I eat the ice cream. Then who comes out? The persecutor, right? The persecutor comes out going, what are you doing? You didn't walk enough to burn off, you know, the calories in that cup. You should have never eaten that. You're never going to get to your goal. You are completely um, off basis and you're an idiot for doing that. So that's that story we start telling ourselves in the negative self-talk. So you can see how we can play in that drama triangle all by ourselves. We don't internally. Have have another. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, Rachel's going to be so kind as to give us a free gift to give to you, which is the bad drama triangle and the good triangle and how we can revise that. So when you listen to this, make sure you go to the show notes and it'll take you back to Rachel's page on the Smart Dating Academy website. And we're going to share her online dating photos, maybe a picture of her with Fly Guy, some interesting comments that came from this episode and a download where you can get the drama triangle and the triangle you want to be in. So Rachel, you are amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably. And now knowing how hard it is for you to be vulnerable. I know how hard you've come to be able to even talk to us today about what you've been through. So thank you. We're humbled and incredibly grateful that you're here with us. And, you know, is there any last thing, last bit of hope or inspiration or advice you'd like to give the person who's listening to this? I would say David Emerald wrote the, the triangle of where you want to be. It's called the empowerment dynamic. And he wrote a book called TED, T-E-D. It's an acronym for the empowerment dynamic. It's an easy read, even if you don't like to read it, but it's a fictitious story about a guy named Ted. And it really drives this point home about the drama triangle and getting off that and getting into an empowerment mindset. And that the power's here. It's not anything anyone's going to do for you. It's about you making a conscious shift in the way that you view the world to then provoke different outcomes and a different approach to solving your own problems. So I highly recommend that book. And I will send you the um, drama triangle, Cartman, Stephen Cartman's drama triangle next to the empowerment dynamic, David Emerald's empowerment dynamic. And you know, I appreciate this time together. Thank you so much for having me. My gosh, I'm going to have to think about my own internal drama triangle when I stare at some Cheetos later in the day today. <laughs> I'm going to be the perpetrator, the victim as well. As, what's the third one? Rescuer. The rescuer. Yeah. yeah, you've had a bad day today. Have the Cheetos. You suck for eating the Cheetos, you <laughs> loser. I can just hear all of my inner monologues now. So thank you, Rachel. And for more information, um, we'll have everything in the show notes where you can look at Rachel and you can get your drama triangle. So thank you. And as usual, if you love this episode, give us five stars write a review, tell Rachel how freaking amazing she is for sharing her journey of betrayal and healing with us. Until next time, we will see you soon.